Psalm 96. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. O worship the Lord in beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. The world also shall be established, that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. Let the heavens rejoice, and let the earth be glad, and let the sea roar, and the fullness thereof. Let the field be joyful, and all that is therein. Then shall all the trees of the wood rejoice. Before the Lord, for he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness. And the people with this truth. Let's pray. If you're like, well, thank you for this passage. Thank you for the opportunity to consider your word. Thank you for Psalm 96 that, uh, that we can hear the, the, the proclamation that your people will proclaim to the whole world the proclamation of your return, the proclamation of your righteousness and your beauty and your holiness and, and the, uh, the call to bring upon him, bring to him things worthy due unto his name. Lord, I pray that you help us to do that tonight and help us to be faithful to you, to be worthy to, to sing of you and to speak of you and to be the faithful witness to proclaim your power and your beauty and your righteousness and your wonder and your judgment to come. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to do righteously. In just that prayer. Amen. Alright, so here in this passage we have, of course, been looking at several different things in the fourth book of the Psalms. We have been looking uh, at the fact that, uh, that God is our dwelling place, that God is our secret place, and that God is uh, that God is our rest. God is our vengeance. And so we see uh, in His rest, we have rest from our internal troubles and struggles and and discontentment and worries about our salvation, worries about our safety and the things that are having to do with us. And so we're able to enter into His rest uh, because He works for us. He provides for us. He is able to protect us. He is able to do all things for us. And then, of course, we see saw last week that He is our vengeance. He is our vengeance, of course, uh, in uh, a couple uh, a couple weeks ago. In fact, Psalm 94, O Lord, to whom vengeance belongeth. We see that uh, it is not our job to right every wrong in this world uh, as the church. And of course, you know, God has given the sword to the government and that uh, we can call upon the government to do righteously and to, and to do those things. But as the church, we're not necessarily supposed to be uh, directly involved in social justice and trying to uh, be that sword. You know, the Catholic Church had tried to be that sword, if you will, of justice and ended up messing a lot of things up. You, when you try to usurp the authority that God has given to another, you mess things up. And so we need to realize our place as the local church is not to be the one who bears the sword, but it is the one who bears the word. Uh, it is the one that bears the voice. And so we see here in this psalm, uh, we saw where we are in his rest and he is able uh, to, to protect us and that we need to give up vengeance to the Lord. And then we come here in, in Psalm 95, we'll come, let us sing unto the Lord, let us make a joyful noise unto the rock of our salvation, for he is great God and great King above all gods. Harden not your hearts is in the provocation. You know, we, we need to learn how to enter in, labor to rest. Remember that from, from last week, labor to rest, as Hebrews says. Uh, we need to take the effort, even though we know that we need to be in God, even though we know that we need to rely on him, that he is able to do it. As Christians, it's often hard to do that. And so we need to learn to labor, to rest, learn to let it go unto him. And that's one of the hardest things that we've ever been asked to do. You know, we want to have control. We want to have the ability uh, to right every wrong and to, uh, to fix every problem. You know, the uh, guys were typically like this. We were basically, oh, there's a problem? Let me fix it. Let me, let me figure out the way to fix this thing. No. Uh, a lot of times, the people say in relationship advice, you know, you got to... Uh, uh, you got to just listen to your wife. Don't try to fix her problems, just listen to her. You know, so oftentimes, uh, that, is, that is the way of, of marriage advice is oftentimes that they say that, is that uh, sometimes you can't fix something by doing something. You just fix something by not doing something. Oh, except just listen, to bear one another's burdens, to 
hear each other's concerns and just be there for somebody, and that's the comfort that's needed. And, and so, but oftentimes we don't want to be that. We want to be Mr. Fixit. Uh, we want to be the, the Mr. Fixit. So uh, here in this passage, we see that we've got to leave that up to God. We've got to, we've got to let God be our rest. We've got to let God be uh, our, the, the, our protector. We've got to let God do all those things. We've got to rest in God and labor to do that. And it's a struggle every day. We need to die daily. We need to let these things happen daily. It's a moment by moment thing because, you know, once once we get into the flesh, we'll be trying to fix the problems like that, you know, and we just cannot bear uh, to let it go sometimes. And so, it's a very difficult thing to do, and, and, uh, but with the Lord's help, we can do that. And that was Psalm 95, uh, teaching us how we can do that, not allowing our necks to get stiff, allowing to be tender to the Word of God. Now, there are, of course, things that you need to be stiff against. You know, you need to resist the devil. You need to be stiff-necked against certain things. You know, you can't just let your mind be open because then your brains will fall off, right? Uh, that, that's what they say, you have an open mind, your brains fall off. But, uh, uh, but you want to be tender to the things of righteousness and, and simple to those things of evil. And so we, we see here in this passage, uh, if we cannot uh, take vengeance upon others, and we need to leave that to God, and, and so forth, then how do we right the wrongs? How do we do those things? What is it that the church is supposed to do? Are we just supposed to sit back and take it? Uh, what are we supposed to do? Are we just supposed to hide under a rock and be quiet? Uh, and, and we see in the previous passages uh, where it talks about if God had not been his help. Psalm 94, verse 16. Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? And who will stand for me against the works of iniquity? Unless the Lord had been my help, my soul almost dwelled in silence. My soul almost dwelled in silence. And so in Psalm 94, verse 17, we see that when God is our protector, when God is the helper to us, uh, we are able to stand boldly. We are able to be bold and brave and courageous and not to fight, not to be vindictive, not to receive revenge, but to proclaim the word of the Lord. And so what we need to proclaim the word of the Lord is for all people to enter into Christ, for all people to bring their glory unto God. And so what our proclamation is, as the church of God, since we are from a dwelling place inside of God, and that we understand that we are holy stones built up at the perfect in Christ, Jesus, as a holy house fitly framed together unto the Lord, and as the church body assembled locally in this church building, uh, we understand that our proclamation is for all people to bring their glory into God, and to bring their glory into the spiritual church. Just as we invite people into church, so too we invite people spiritually into God. And so that's why it's important that we have a building, we have a location, we have a physical presence uh, that we assemble together in because that physical presence is a picture of that spiritual presence of God. It's, remember what we talked about this morning about the Trinity of, of God is that all three dimensions working together to bring harmony into the Lord, to bring that unity, is that fact is that the physical has spiritual symbolics in it. The, thing, the temple of God on the earth was a picture or a symbol of the temple in heaven. And of course, when God is with man, there will be no temple, or God and the Lamb of the temple thereof. And so we need to understand that, uh, that our proclamation to the world is not one of social justice, not one of vengeance, because God's going to take care of all of that when he gets here. Uh, what our call to them is say, get into the boat. If you remember when Noah was preaching uh, before the flood came, and, and uh, he was a preacher of righteousness, he was preaching them to spiritually go into the boat, if you will, to be in Christ, to be saved from the wrath to come. Now, everybody before the flood, I don't know who was saved who wasn't, but I know that only eight souls were saved but by water. And so we need to understand that maybe perhaps there were other people that were saved before the flood and perhaps even died in the flood, but they were not saved uh, through water as God provided for the eight. And so, but we do know that if they accepted Christ spiritually, that in the latter day they will stand in their flesh upon this earth. Uh, as, as Job proclaimed, that even though worms destroy this physical body, I know that I and my flesh will stand on the latter day and see my Redeemer. And that's Job, the oldest book in the written book of the Bible. Uh, Job, I believe, was an Edomite, if you study that out. But, uh, but he, uh, he knew that, that blessing, that privilege, that, that, uh, that truth of God, that even though this body is dead, even though this body is destroyed, it will be raised again uh, to be with Christ. And so we need to understand that that truth is, is not just 
the New Testament revelation, but it's been there all along from the very beginning. So here in this passage, it says, it says in Psalm 96, it says, Sing unto the Lord a new song, sing unto the Lord all the earth. A new song, a new song, sing unto the Lord a new song. You know, it talks about freshness and newness, newness of life. And, and when you think of newness, you think, well, uh, just like the song we sang earlier, it said, uh, it said uh, the, the new song is the old, old story. You know, it's, it's not necessarily that the message is something new or different that we never heard before that God wants you to sing, but rather he wants you to sing with freshness, something new. Uh, the person that is hearing it, it ought to seem that you're saying something new. You oftentimes hear somebody get up in, in pulpit and, and what they're saying, they don't seem excited about it. It feels like they're they're struggling and they don't really care to say the message again. And it's like this is nothing new to them. They they don't really care about this message. Why should I care about it? You know, it's not new to them, it's not fresh to them. And we need to learn to sing unto the Lord a new song. And it must be new every morning. Bob talks about how his mercies are new every morning. And so if his verses are new every morning, our song ought to be renewed every morning. It ought to be new every morning. It should be refreshing to sing it. It should be encouraging to sing it. It shouldn't be, when you think of something, you want to see something fresh and clean and new. You don't want to see something that is old and dusty and fake. You want to see something that is new. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. So the proclamation is one of proclaiming a song, to sing to them. When you hear a song, it's something that appeals to people. It's not just a raspy voice and an annoying person. So a lot of times you hear people get up and they proclaim in a mean voice, an angry voice, a horrendous voice, but rather the proclamation of the Lord is, a, is in song. It is in one of joy. It is one, when they hear the voice of God, when they hear uh, those songs and psalms and and the message of God, it ought to be something that is encouraging. It ought to appeal to somebody's soul. It ought to be there. It shouldn't be, everybody, sometimes you see those preachers, they oftentimes get up and they brag about offending the, those evil sinners. Oh, I, got, I really planned to see that guy. He got offended. He started killing out of me. Now, yeah, of course, you can jar somebody. Sometimes people who are very hard into the Word of God need to be jarred away and stuff. But in general, the, the message of the Lord ought to be in song, a joyful song, a glad song, something that rejoices the heart. Now, will the message of God, the judge, he coming to judge the earth in righteousness, will that be an unpleasant song for somebody who is delighting in wickedness? It will be, won't it? But will it be a joyful song for those that are desiring to be, uh, to, that are perhaps maybe downtrodden and, and, and offended or, or hurt? And they're, they're hurting in their soul, and they're just, they've been hurt by this world so much that they've lost faith, they've lost confidence, and, then, and their struggles appear to a lot of people as, I mean, all that dirty sinner, and I'm going to go and offend them because they're, they're wicked before God. In reality, what is needed, and it's not hardness, but softness and, and kindness. You know, you think of when, uh, I, I believe it was Hosea's wife, when she, she was an adulterer, she was a harlot, and she was rescued from that life by, by Hosea because God called him to, to, to bring her out of that. But she went back into it. And then because she went back into it, he cut her off from, from all the things and all the stuff. And then eventually she found herself in a very bad state. And he came to her and he talked kindly to her and he brought her out of that. He, he brought her home. And so we need to understand that the, 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 he's singing to the Lord a new song, singing to the Lord all the earth. He, he wants the world to sing. Not only should we sing to the world, but the world needs to sing back to God. You know, that's what God desires, that the creation, he, he spoke into existence, he wishes the creation to speak back to him. Uh, not in something cruel and mean, and we ourselves don't want that. We understand that we don't want some cruel and mean person uh, shaking a bony finger as, how dare you do this, how dare you, in, in condemnation. Obviously, if, if we, we deserve condemnation, but the Bible talks about how that we are condemned already. That's already been done. People generally know what they are as sinners. You know, of course, you got people that uh, that deny that they're sinners. But in general, most people know that they're sinners. Most people know that they've done wickedly. And, and the job of the of the person is not to say us versus them, but rather as a fellow sinner, say, hey, here's some bread. Here's something I found. Here's something great that I found. 
And it's to go alongside with and to guide them in Christ, not to say, you wicked sinners, God doesn't like you and you're all going to hell. No, well, you understand that, yes, there will be people that refuse God, that rejected God, and that are rejected God, and, and that uh, they, need to, they need to be, if they don't receive Christ, they need to be taken out of the way. If they're trying to destroy people and harm people, then that is obviously a criminal act before the Lord. And, and we need to understand that the Lord will judge those people when he gets here. But our job is to sing uh, unto the Lord. Sing unto the Lord and bless his name, show forth salvation from day to day. Those that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you call upon the name of the Lord. Lord, I believe on you. I, I praise you. I want to thank you for the salvation that you provided for us. You're blessing his name. You bless the Lord. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry. And you be soon taken out of the way. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name, show forth his salvation from day to day. So we as Christians need to sing this song to the world, and, and the world needs to sing this song to God. Thank you, God, for your salvation. See, we as Christians need to remind the world that God died for them. Christ uh, paid the price for you. You were a, you, you were a sinner, and you, you, you were condemned to hell, but Christ came and paid the price for you. Proclaim his salvation. You know, that is a pleasant thing to hear, that, that a lot of times those street preachers or somebody will, will just stop at the condemnation. And then all it is is condemnation, condemnation, condemnation. That's not what is needed. Yes, they need to acknowledge your sin, but what he says here is to show forth his salvation. See, salvation is not condemnation of the sinner, but rather a rescuing of the parish, a rescuing of the sinner. And so... What God is calling us to do as his, as living in him, from living within him, is declare his salvation from day to day. It's supposed to be a daily act, the way we live our life, the way we proclaim life, uh, the way we speak. It all needs to declare his salvation. Now, now, obviously, it doesn't mean that every person that you see, you're going to say, hey, I got four points in a poem, and, and, and I want you to pray this prayer, and hey, you're saved. Now, if, if you want to go ahead and do that, that's your personality, go right ahead. But, but what it's talking about, so for the salvation, it can be in a comment, it can be in a conversation. Uh, if you can win somebody's soul within a, a five-minute presentation, you go for it. I, I'm not hindering that one bit. But it also means that every day, a lot of people that you work with, it'll just be a little by little sometimes. You know, sometimes they're not welcoming uh, a direct conversation, but it's through your life, through through the things that you do in your conversation that they say, hey, there's something that they have. They, they're proclaiming something that I've not heard uh, in, 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 in society. They're, they're, they're singing a song. They, you look at them, they have a song in their heart. You know, and, and I would like to sing that song as well. You see, that's the gospel message in one sense is that, uh, is that we're singing this song in our heart. We're proclaiming it with our mouth. And you know, ever, ever get a catchy tune this morning, earlier, uh, Bridget was playing on the piano, and what were people doing over here? She, they weren't, she wasn't singing the song, right? But she was just playing on the piano, the melody, and then they filled in the words, right? Why, why is that? Because she played it from her heart, and then they played it from their mouth. And so from the fingers. So that's the gospel message. That's how we proclaim. It is not uh, just condemnation or, or, or three points in a poem and, or, or prayer, it, but rather it is in a life dedicated unto the Lord, singing, having that song in your heart, singing to the Lord, declaring his glory. Verse 3 Declare his glory among the heathen. Declare his glory among the heathen. Well, these people don't believe in God, so I'm not going to quote Bible verses. I'm not going to do these things. I'm, not, I'm just going to keep quiet. No, just declare his glory. You ever seen those, uh, I always like to, uh, the movies where they have the, the little black lady sitting on the porch, and, and uh, she's always saying, praise Jesus, you know, thank you, Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yes, uh -huh. and, and she's just rocking back and forth, or she's usually, you know, the old-fashioned show over there, or she's breaking, like, maybe snap beans or something, you know, and uh, this country black lady, she's always talking to Jesus, you know, and this lady, she's been always praying to Jesus, and, and it just, and it's not like she's trying to, like, quote every single person about it, but she's just saying, thank you, Jesus, or she's like, oh, yes, Lord, bless me today, oh, yes, and, and it's just it's that southern draw or whatever, you know, I don't want to try to attempt it, but, but you understand, Declare his glory. Declare his glory. It doesn't have to be 
uh, kind of dry, well, I don't know all the verses to get somebody saved, and so maybe uh, I won't say anything. No, it's just say what you can, and then, and then they, the Lord will do the rest. You play with your fingers, and the Lord will bring a song out of their heart. Yeah. And so we need to understand that the Bible is already, the, the Word of God, the law, is already written on everybody's heart. You need to realize this, is that even though we may not consciously understand it, he says he's written on the tables of their heart. What they don't know in consciousness is already in their spirit. Why? Because that spirit was from God. And so you need to tap into that. You need to be able to learn how to tap into that because every one of us, even to the hardened sinner, to the uh, most humblest of saints, has the same spirit from God. And so we need to understand, but we need to tap into that, and then, and then that joy, declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among the people. You declare it, you declare the world to declare it, and then the world will be salt and light through that, the declaration. You know, so you don't get salt and light in this world by making everybody read the, the label of salt. Look, this is salt! You know, look, this is a light bulb. It is plugged into the wall. It is, you know, oftentimes we want to try to give somebody light by explaining them how to turn on a light bulb. You know, or, or we want to give somebody salt by explaining them the, the directions on the package. Uh, but in reality, salt and light are given to the world just by declaring it, just by proclaiming it. it, it read, you say, hey, okay, you've got a salty driveway here, it needs to be clear of ice. Here's the direction on the salt, and I will let you do it. Hey, how about instead of you following the directions and all this stuff, you just salt that driveway for them, you know, and, and say, hey, this is how you salt it. You, you by example, show them, uh, and so forth. Some people, you get the nerdy ones, you know, that they, they benefit from reading all the instructions, you know. Uh, some people, you can grab the Bible at their door. This is wonderful, and a lot of people should do it. Uh, and you can give them the verses, and then a step-by-step -step process, they can think through it, they can chew on it. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's it, that's it. Okay, I will, I'll accept that. But other people, they're more visually minded. They're more, they, they don't think about things methodically. You know, there's different brain chemistry, the way people are acting up. Uh, but you need to, they, they respond more to maybe the voice or to an action or, or doing something. Maybe they don't care about what you say, but what you do. Maybe they don't care, they say, oh, I don't believe that's it, but then they see you do a humble thing for somebody. Maybe they see you do something for somebody that, uh, that needed help. Maybe you stopped by and, and just maybe changed the tire for somebody. Or you did some little piece of labor and then they say, hey, maybe there is something to what's changed their heart. And, and then maybe even, in, uh, maybe it's not a, a direct approach of a presentation of verses, which is wonderful, and, and that's my primary way I prefer to do it. But maybe it's oftentimes just having a song on your heart. You hear the person, he gets that catchy tune in his head, Hey, this is a fun song. I like those songs. Where where can I hear those? Oh, you go to church? Okay, I'll go to church and hear some of those songs. You know, that, that's that's a way a lot of people go into it. It's not it's not always a direct approach that will get somebody, but it is just you yourself being Christian, being the proclaimer of God's word, and, and not being vengeful, not feeling tit for pat. And, and you know, a lot of times people say, Well, you did you know what Sheila did the other day? Oh, how dare you? And they're always busy talking about people. And not ideas. They're, they're not talking about the wonderful things of the Lord. And then when you make a conversation about giving glory to God and, and talking about your wonderful walk with the Lord, you can have the worst life ever. You can have the worst events happen in your life. But if you have a good walk with the Lord, you can always have something to have joy and sing about. And so when you're in Christ, when you're resting in Christ, you're laboring and working to do that, then you can actually be able to sing unto the Lord. And so he says, declare his glory among the heathen. You know, it doesn't matter whatever happens in your life when you're talking about somebody else. When you're, especially when you're talking about God, then it doesn't matter what's happening in your life, you always have something good to talk about. And, and so that's, that's always a wonderful thing to do, is declare His glory among the heathen, His wonders among all the people. So His glory among the heathen, and then His wonders among all the people. So not only do you sing into the heathen, all right, I'm not around heathen anymore, I'm around church folks, so I can complain and, and murmur and, and, and do talk about my own things. Now, no, he said, and among all the people, his wonders. You know, the, the neat thing is that his glory can be declared upon the heathen because they don't see his light. But then, but then among the brethren and, and the sisters, you can declare his wonders. Oh, did you ever hear about God doing this? How can God do that? You're contemplating 
God. You're thinking about things that are spiritual. And you're learning to do that, and you're declaring them with your mouth. You're, you're declaring the glory, and, and you're declaring his wonders among the people. And they says, why, why should we do this? Why should we even talk about God? For the Lord is great, and greatly to be praised, he is to be feared above all gods. So why are we supposed to do this? It's because if you ignore the creator God, the, the covenant God, uh, the person that has a relationship with you, the person that has created you, the person that has provided your spirit, the person who's written on your hearts his law, if you, if you reject him, if you, if you don't pay attention to him, then you will be destroyed at the end of the age. That's why it's important to talk about him daily, because, because we won't be able to be, the people that we love, the people that we need to reach with the gospel, won't be reached by the gospel if we aren't declaring his word. It, it won't get to them any other way. There's not this mystical, uh, magical fairy dust that somebody gets sprinkled with and all of a sudden they, the Holy Spirit is dealing with them. The Holy Spirit deals them with them by the voice of his people. Because the Holy Spirit is dealing primarily as the Holy Ghost convicting one another through the voice of his believers. And that's why we should sing every day so that the Holy Ghost can deal with people Every day. <clears throat> says, for the God, for all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. You see that little image sitting over on the side? They say, oh, this image represents such and such a spirit. That image represents such and such a spirit. But the thing is, those spirits can't talk. The Holy Ghost talks through his servants. This Holy Ghost talks through his people. Those idols sitting on the wall, they may represent some demon or some spirit or some crazy thing, but those spirits, they don't talk through... Uh, through people, they they are they are as the Bible says idols. They are mute. They they cannot speak. They cannot hear. They can't do those things. They can only do what the devil tells them to do, and, and they can only torment people. It says honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. See, so verse five says all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. So why should we? choose this God among all the other ones. Well, because, they're again, they're idols. They don't do anything. They're, they're just a figurehead. They're a symbol. It's like, it's, it's a, sort of like, for example, the, the power of an idol would be the picture, for an example, if we had the United States flag here. Now, that flag represents something. You know, it, it, it's, it, it's symbolic of something. It, it, uh, it brings forth in people a, a pride and, and, and an appreciation and and the, the liberties we have as Americans. And we stand up here and we can say, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. It stands for a republic. It stands for our nation. It stands for a symbolic thing. And, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, individual and justice for, liberty and justice for all. And so we can understand, we can look at that flag, we have deep appreciation. We, we can look at it and say, oh, this stands for this, that stands for this. Uh, and that's what the idols were back in that day. That flag, you know, obviously in, in battle and such, uh, they had such a <coughs> that that if that flag were to fall in battle, somebody would run and pick it up. You remember in the back in, in the old days when they would carry the, 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 the flags before the armies and, and stuff, and then they would have the flag barrier, and the other armies would always try to shoot down that flag barrier. And so that is sort of how those idols started out. Eventually, they got uh, assigned to them some false ideas and stuff. Oh, yeah, it, not only is this symbolic, but it's fighting for us. You know, our flag doesn't fight for us. We fight for, we uh, rally around that flag for, for symbolic reasons. But, but just as that flag is just material and, and, and people uh, focus symbolic symbolism to it and, and so forth, uh, the, the, the power is in the symbolism. The power is in uh, people's efforts to rally around it, right? But it's, the flag itself is nothing. And so too it is these gods, these, these idols. They, back in the day, instead of flags, they would have a, a personage that perhaps lived long ago. It was maybe Nebuchadnezzar or something, or, or some sort of king. Nimrod would be idolized, if you will. Uh, our great leader Nimrod is still with us through this, uh, through this idol, and, and he's fighting for us if you will. Uh, and so he's saying here in this passage, that's just a ball. That's just an idol. That, that does nothing. It just moves. It sits there. People focus on that. People put their, put their appreciation towards it and so forth. But all it is is ultimately an idol. And its power is only in its people. But you see, the thing that is different than from that thing and our God is that we worship the Creator. 
the purpose of all life is in Him. He created us to work for Him. And, and so that is the difference between the gods, is that, that our God is not a dumb idol that people like a flag would put their appreciation onto and rally around and, and say, oh, don't let it touch the ground because it symbolizes this, this embodiment of our, uh, of, our, of our great pride in our country or whatever. And, and don't get me wrong, I appreciate what the flag, the flag stands for. You know, I'll, I'll pay direct as an expert. But we need to understand that is ultimately what they appear, that these things were in, in the scriptures here. Uh, a flag, we understand, is immaterial, but back then they thought that symbolic thing was actually embodied by something. And in fact, it was embodied by a demon, by uh, Paul the Apostle Seth tells us. So it says, For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. And of course, in Hebrew, also the word idol means nothing. Uh, it, it's, and of course, in English, it means if somebody is sit, sit, sitting around or standing around, we'd say, why are you guys being so idle? Why are you sitting around? Why, why are you not doing work? Why are you... And so that... So we need to understand is that our God is not like that. Our God made the heavens. He's not idle. He doesn't sit around. He's not just a symbolic figurehead. He is somebody who is an active force in our lives. He holds the universe together. Every molecule is actively being held together by God. The fact that we have this one here... The fact that we have our bodies is the fact, and the fact that we have life is the fact that we have God that is ever present with us. It says, For the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Why? Because he actively holds us together, quite literally. He, he actively uh, works in our lives. He, yes, he has made laws and things that nature abides by and continues on, but he is able and active to insert himself into those laws, uh, into that nature. So it says, because of that fact, because that we, by him, we, now all things consist, it says, give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people. If you consist, and all things do consist by God, then isn't it natural that all those things consist for the glory of God? What well, what happens if something does not consist for the glory of God? It, it's not fulfilling its purpose. It's it, it's corrupted. It, it it's not fulfilled. It's not proper. It says, "Give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people, give unto the Lord glory and strength." Because He created us and He actively holds everything together by His strength, we should actively, in our voice, give strength to our voice, uh, give beauty to our voice, give give uh, give song to our voice says, strength and beauty are in him. It says, honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. So we need to understand that we need to have honor and majesty. We give to a flag, but even more so, we have to give it to God. Give unto the Lord, O ye kindred of the people. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. See, this is a, not only is it the heavenly sanctuary that has strength and beauty, but his physical representation on this earth, which is the local church, ought to have strength and beauty as well. It should have that in its people. It should have that in its uh, architecture. It should have some, some comeliness to it. it. It should have some beauty to it. When somebody comes here, they should say, no, no obviously I'm not saying be decked out in gold and silver and all these things and stuff. That's not the type of beauty that I'm talking about. The beauty that we're talking about is one that says, uh, arrayed in modest apparel and humbleness. Uh, you know, when the Bible talks about how the lady is not to be in board and chair and, and all this super expensive material things, but rather it is the beauty of the heart. It is the beauty of the spirit. It is the beauty that comes out of our mouths. You see, some of the pe most plainest people uh, the, that, uh, that walk this earth, uh, if you, to look at them, you want to think that that person was very beautiful or anything, but when you hear them speak or when you see their nature, they become very beautiful. Not because of their physical appearance, but because of what is in their heart. And that's the beauty that's talking about here. Strength and beauty. Even if the physical body is weak, and you've seen a lot of these humble, weak prayer warriors of ladies that, that they can't do anything anymore. They, they're, you know, they're not going 24-7, uh, moment by moment, door to door, knocking, proclaiming the word of God. But, but they're, in, they, they're quiet, and they're humble, and they're, they're, they're praying to the Lord, and their strength is in their prayer. And their, their physical strength may be gone, but their strength and beauty of prayer is stronger than anyone else's. You see, we need to understand that 
those people are, are just as much and even more needful today than is the person actively door knocking. See, people say, well, I, I can't do anything for God anymore in my old age. You're wrong. You can do more than ever. You can do more than ever. Just think about Moses and think about uh, all the older people uh, that, they're, that the, the, the patriarchs, they did more in their old age than they did in their young age. So it says, give it to the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people. So he's telling us to give it unto the Lord. We don't proclaim the word of God necessarily to give it to the creation or to give it to others. We proclaim the word of God because we're giving it to the Lord. When our focus is, it stops being to everybody else, but to the Lord. Uh, and say, I'm proclaiming God's salvation because I'm proclaiming it to God. And then when you're proclaiming it to God, then it'll go much further because your focus is on God and not trying to, to, to check mark, oh, I got five converts today, oh, I got my notch in my belt. Uh, how did you get today? Uh, there's a little competition going on here. Uh, I don't mind a little competition or whatever. But, uh, but our focus in salvations and soul winning is not to be on the numbers. Though we would love to have more and more done numerically come to the Lord, but our focus on soul winning, a lot of times the people you see uh, they they look and say, well, you know, that door knocking doesn't work anymore because we door knocked 100,000 doors and we only had two people come to the church and so it doesn't work anymore. That's not the purpose of soul winning to get numbers in your church. The purpose of soul winning is to glorify God. When you go to every person's door like in, the, in the Great Commission or whatever, uh, and in the process of your daily life proclaiming the word of the Lord, you're not, your focus isn't trying to get them converted necessarily. Your focus is to proclaim the message of God, and then cast your bread upon the waters, and you'll find it after many days. You, you, you proclaim the word of God to the Lord, and then His word will not return void. Yeah. When you're focusing your words through the Holy Spirit, David spake, if you will. If David spake through the Holy Spirit when he proclaimed the words, that is when we are thousands of years later reading his words. Just think how powerful our words would be if we stopped trying to focus on that individual that we're trying to get saved, but rather we proclaim that message, of course, to him in conversation, but for the Lord, on behalf of the Lord. That is the Holy Ghost speaking through my message. That is not just me saying some words to somebody. That is me proclaiming the word of the Lord on behalf of the Lord, for the Lord, and then it's the Lord is getting that person saved. Mm -hmm. And so we need to understand that's what the message is. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. So do we execute that? Do we show forth that? Do we give unto the Lord, O ye kindred of the people? Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Do we give the Lord our glory and strength? Or do we give something else our glory and strength? So the focus we need to, we're in Christ, we're in, we're in God, we need to give unto Him our glory and strength because we are His building. We are fitly framed together. We make up His building. We are supposed to proclaim. And it just reminds me of when Christ entered into Jerusalem, I'd say, these stones would cry out. If you were to decide, these stones would cry out. The physical stones. And we, much more spiritual stones, ought to cry out. Give unto the Lord glory due unto His name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. What offering? Oh, a song. The proclamation. That's all God wants from you. It isn't that awesome? You can labor to rest. Let me do everything. And all I want you to do is sing my song. That's all I want you to do. Sing my song. And isn't that awesome to think that we don't have to seek vengeance for the Lord? We don't have to usher in his kingdom, if you will. We don't have to fight the battles of the Lord and, and save the universe from the devil. No. We just have to sing it to the Lord. Isn't that awesome? That, that's all we have to do. But worship the Lord in beauty of His holiness and fear before Him all the earth. So the proclamation we do is to tell everybody to sing it to the Lord. That, that, that's the goal. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. When you're singing unto the Lord, why do you tell them, hey, the Lord's in power here. This is the world's Lord. This, this, is, this is God's creation. He made it, you know. And this is what He did. You don't have to be like, well, you know, the, the evolution. Oh, we're going to fight against evolution. No, just, just proclaim the, the, that God created it all. That God made that. You, you walk down the street, and just, just for the fun of it, someday, you just walk down the street, and you start pointing at stuff. God made that. God made that. God made that. God made that. And then people are like, what are you talking about? What are you doing here? You look like a crazy person saying that. And you say, oh, yeah, I'm just saying, God made that. Just, just saying it. 
Okay, so, so we need to understand that's, that's really all that gospel message is, the proclaiming the gospel is, is just saying it. You, you don't have to try to convert anybody. You, don't have to, you know, it says go to all the world and preach the gospel. It doesn't say go to all the world and convert everybody. No, some versions say go into the world and make disciples. Oh, it's your job to go in there and convince everybody and train everybody. No, you, you go into the world, proclaim the gospel, and then those who receive it, you baptize them into the Lord, and then and then what do you do? You teach them all things that I have commanded you. You teach people to sing unto the Lord. That's what you do. And, and so that, that's what it is. But worship the Lord in the beauty of His holiness. In the beauty. You just worship Him in the beauty of His holiness. Proclaim His name. Proclaim His salvation. Fear before Him all the earth. So you tell them, you need, to, you need to be humble before the Lord. You just tell people, you need to be humble before the Lord. You need to consider Him. He's created you. You don't have to have all these theological uh, excuses or reasonings or, oh, i got to limit my logic. i got to win. Just tell them, fear the Lord. God created you. What are you doing as God's creation? You just tell them. It's just, and, and you leave the converting of the Lord. You just sing that song. Say to the heathen that the Lord reigned. God's in power. God manages. God, God made all of this. The world also shall be established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. Hey, when God gets here, He's going to fix this problem. You know, that, that, that can be a good one. That can be a good one that you can use is that um, when somebody starts complaining, well, you know, Aunt Susie started doing this to me, and, you know, and, and, and this old person did me wrong, this old person stole my car, and this old person did this and that, and, and, uh, and killed my dog, or whatever. He's like, well, when the Lord comes back, I'm going to fix that for you. <laughs> you know, just whatever, whatever you want to do, it's just, you, you always have ways to sing the song of the Lord. Mm -hmm. That the Lord reigneth, the world also shall be established. And you talk about people who say, oh, this problem here, problem there, uh, the problem in this nation or that nation, and the war over there. It says, yeah, I'll be glad when God gets back. He'll establish this thing. He will, he'll keep those people from moving the world. He'll keep those people from influence and hurting people. And I'll just be glad when he gets back. It says, let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let the sea roar, and the fullness thereof. And the fullness thereof. So everything, we want to tell everything to be glad and to, to sing that song, to, to <clears throat> give unto the Lord the glory due to his name. And, and so we need to understand that, uh, that eventually this creation itself, it says here, let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let the sea roar and the fullness thereof, let the field be joyful, and all that is therein shall all the trees and the wood rejoice. All the trees in the wood shall rejoice. So not only will mankind rejoice if we sing this song, but nature itself will rejoice. Well, we see this in, uh, in Romans 8, chapter 21. Romans 8, chapter 21. Or, or, or Romans chapter 8, verse 21. Uh, Ro let's go ahead and look. Romans chapter 8, verse 19 through 23. It says, For the earnest expectation of the creature, the trees, the hills, everything, <coughs> and the animals, Waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. You know, creation is waiting for us to sing this song. Creation is waiting for the sons of God to proclaim this to all the earth, uh, to, to, to do this. And when we do, it says, For the creature may subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So when we proclaim the word of the Lord, not only will uh, the people be delivered, but the earth itself will be delivered. For we know that the whole creation grown in the travail and pain together until now, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, we who are proclaiming the word of the Lord through the Spirit, uh, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. And so we need to understand that, yeah, eventually, even though our spirit is saved, even though our spirit is ready, uh, creation is still in bondage. People are still in bondage. People, uh, our bodies are still in bondage. But as we sing the song, as we uh, proclaim that God is going to be back and He's going to return, uh, we're going to realize that when He returns, not only will we be free in a glorified body, but also so will creation because it's waiting for us. Remember, mankind was given the authority over all creation. And because we have fallen, in sin and corruption, so too will the whole world, the creature, the cre uh, is, is subjected to this torment, is groaning and desiring his return. It says, let the field be joyful. 
The fields aren't necessarily yet joyful yet because it is groaning underneath the burden of sin. Uh, it says, before the Lord, for he cometh, for he cometh to, he says, he says, be joyful before the Lord, for he cometh, for he cometh to the judge the earth. We're joyful because God is coming back. He's not left us to our own devices. He's making, he's preparing a place for us in heaven. Uh, and then when he returns in glory, he will judge this earth. He will set all those wrongs and those, those things that were in, in the last chapter about vengeance that we want to right by our sheer action, those will be set to right by the Lord. Before the Lord, for he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth, he shall judge the world in righteousness and the people with his truth. He's going to come back one day, and, uh, and a good an example of this of creation rejoicing would be Isaiah chapter 35. We look here real quick, Isaiah chapter 35. The wilderness and the solitary places shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. When he returns, it will blossom. If you think it's beautiful now, you just think when it stops having to groan underneath our pain. The desert shall rejoice and the blossom shall as the rose, and shall it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Strengthen ye weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. So, so what is the proclamation? Hey, even though this world is under pain, is under suffering, and is groaning until the manifestation of the sons of God, until he comes back in his glory, it says to strengthen your weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. If it wasn't for God, we would have slipped and we would have been silent. But because He is our protector, because we are in Him, we can strengthen our knees, we can stand up and say, God is our strength, and we can proclaim this message with boldness. And it says, Say unto them that are of fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, for God will come with vengeance, even God with recompense. Those things that you're so worried about, God will take care of you. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. When people have lost faith because of the wickedness of this world, when Christ return, returns, those eyes will be opened, uh, his blessings will flow in. Then shall the lame man leave his heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing, for in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and thirsty land springs of water. And the habitation of dragons, which each, where each place shall be grass with reeds and rushes. And in a highway shall be there a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those of the wavering men, though fools shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go upon thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow, and singing shall flee, and sighing shall flee away. So what we will have in physicalness at the return of Christ, we can have even today in Christ through the Spirit. That joy that, 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 that flows through the Spirit physically when He returns soon, we can have now. So the question is, do we want this now or do we want it later? You know, do we want to waste our time being visible now or do we want to have that joy now? Well, we have the opportunity now to have it. Let's look over real quickly to Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14 and then maybe Revelation chapter 21 and then we'll be done. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16 through 17. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem, remember those people, the heathen that raged, the ones that were so fearful of, the ones that are, are, are against God and, and, and rejected Him, it says that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up for a year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of the tabernacles. And it shall be that those who will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. This joy will not come upon, this, this creation, the, the, the glory of the creation uh, that will sing unto the Lord will not come upon those who reject the Lord in the land. And so too that if we don't sing it, if we don't give them rain now, and if we don't receive that rain now, we're not going to have that in our own lives. And so we can come every year, we can come every day into Jerusalem, the heavenly of heavenlies, uh, to that, uh, through the Spirit, through the kingdom, to receive that joy now. We can have it now. 
It's definitely a blessed hope for the physicalness of it, but we can have it spiritually now. And then finally, of course, Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, verse 24 through 27. It says, And the nations of them that which, which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. What did the psalm say for us to bring? Bring your glory and honor. Bring beauty of holiness, strength of holiness. Uh, proclaim it to the Lord. That psalm was not for the end time. That psalm is for now. And yet, in the finality, this is what they'll be doing physically, but we can do it now. We can get a jump start on it, if you will. It says, in verse 25, the gates shall not be shut, shall not be shut all, at all by day, but there shall be no night there. They shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, and there shall be in no wise to turn into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, nor maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So we see here that when we proclaim this now, people can enter in now through the Spirit, and then they can be saved. The nations that can be saved, those nations that shall be saved are the nations that are saved spiritually now. The ones that are physically saved and entering in then, they have to be saved now. They have to be saved spiritually now. And, and when we proclaim that song now through the Spirit, then when those nations that are saved, they'll be saved because, because we proclaim that song now. So we can understand this will give us courage, the fact that because this will be the inevitable end of all things physically, that we don't have to fear those things that are abominable now because when we sing the song, we, it, God will take care of the rest later. So, so our job is not to fight the battles. You know, of course, you know, I'm not saying that you can't join the army and fight for your nation and do all those things uh, that you're supposed to do or do those rules, roles as uh, you know, a part of government, but rather as the church, we can proclaim these things and leave the rest up to the Lord. We can do our job as being the voice of God to preach the gospel to all the nations. So let's do that as a church. Let's proclaim the word of the Lord to all people through, through the song and through the beauty of His holiness. And through His strength, we bring His glory to the whole world. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, thank you for the gift of Thank you for the opportunity to consider your word. Thank you for the opportunity to consider the fact that, uh, that what they will have physically in the future when you return, we can have spiritually now. And the fact that we can sing the song, we can encourage all nations to sing it now, and then it'll be so much the better for our world until you return, Lord. I pray that, you'll, uh, that uh, we'll rely on you, trust in you, to learn to live in you, learn to labor to rest, uh, so that we can sing your song and save the world. Just that prayer. Amen.